Hey everyone, my name is Jake and today we are going to be looking at some malicious compliance stories. So sit back, relax and enjoy. How my father got out of so many speeding tickets, they had to change the law. My father has been a lawyer here in BC, Canada for more than 30 years. When he was starting out in his 30s, he was hustling hard to support a stay-at-home wife and me, his young son. As he was very much a type A personality, with not much patience, he sped on the highways, often, and he got speeding tickets, often. However, he took every single one to court and had every single one overturned. The reason was quite simple. At the time, Canada was in the process of switching over from imperial miles per hour to metric kilometers per hour, and all of the road signs had to be replaced. Now, the BC legal code specified that a road sign was legally comprised of two signs on a pole. Apparently, at some point, someone in charge of replacing all the signs with the new metric ones decided that they could save a considerable amount of money by printing all the information on one sign. But this no longer complied with the specifics of the legal code. So, he would go back to the exact sign that he was ticketed because of and take a picture of it, and then bring the picture to court along with a copy of the laws in question. His defense was very simple. He would allow the arresting officer to take a stand and give his testimony regarding the issue of the ticket, and then show the officer the picture he took and ask them to identify whether that was the sign that he had sped past. They always agreed saying that it was in fact the very same sign. He thanked them and then dismissed them with no further questions. He would then bring the picture to the judge along with the bookmarked page of the BC Highway Act and present the judge with the exact wording of the law, followed by his factual argument that since there was only a single sign posted, it did not constitute a legal road sign as defined in the Highway Act. As I said before, every single ticket was dismissed and all my dad lost was half an hour of his time. This worked for almost a decade, with him overturning literally thousands of dollars of speeding tickets, until the new law was changed. He still speeds by the way. That's great and all and the malicious compliance was there, but it said it took him 30 minutes of his time each time. Surely it would be quicker to just slow down a bit and then you save more than 30 minutes, right? Okay, Mr. Lawyer, I will. So I work as a specialist property valuer. A few years ago, a real estate agent friend approached me on behalf of his client. His client was a bookseller who operated a specialist bookshop on the seventh floor of a city building. A one-man band small business. Nice bloke. Unfortunately, nice bloke decided to renew his lease for five years and signed the new lease without getting advice. His new building owner enacted the market rent review clause and jacked up his rent by something like 50%. Tells nice bloke, your new rent for the next five years is X amount. Nice bloke is distraught. He can't afford it. So he asks nicely to rescind the lease and he will move elsewhere. A state agent friend has found a cheaper space for him. Denied by building owner. Building owner says he will also sue if he breaks the lease. So the agent asks me to review the case. I look through the case. Nice bloke is stuffed, the lease is locked tight, and they are justified in jacking up the rent. I think our only hope is to appeal to the mercy of the building owner's lawyer. So I call him and ask for a release, penalty free for my client. Mr. Lawyer says, Stiff cheddar, you need to comply with the law. Try reading the lease. A real arrogant douchebag. Cue malicious compliance. Okay, I will. 
I read through the lease and note that all references to the Retail Leases Act have been crossed out. Fair enough. The act only applies to retail tenancies if they are below the third floor of a building. Nice bloke is on level 7. Act should not apply. But hold up, I'm a gonna check that. I called the Small Business Commission who administers the act. They advise that if you retail a good, like books, it doesn't matter what floor you are on, the act applies. You could be on the friggin roof if you want. The level 3 provision only applies if you retail a service. This means the building owner has breached the act and failed to comply with the law. There's certain things they have to provide before signing a lease and timing they have to follow. A breach is no small thing. I get a ruling from the commission. I call for mediation with Mr. Lawyer. Present are Mr. Lawyer, building owner and their agent, a nice bloke and me. I again plead for a penalty free release. No dice and they threaten to sue. I gently slide the ruling across the table to Mr. Lawyer. Okay, well, as per your suggestion, I read the lease. We have a ruling that proves the act applies to the lease. Your clients failed to comply with the act and committed a statutory offense. The lawyer reading the ruling. Um, okay, we will grant you a penalty-free release. Oh, we don't need that. We enact our right under the act to terminate the lease penalty free, and to seek damages for the landlord's breach of their statutory obligations, and I'll be reporting the breach to the commission. No need for all that, let's just tear up the lease. Sorry, that wouldn't be complying with the law, would it? Update number one, I just spoke with the agent on our side, we are still good mates. He can't remember the outcome off the top of his head, but he thinks he might have leveraged a waiver of nice blokes make good obligations. A requirement to replace carpets, paint walls, and remove fit out, etc. And he did move nice bloke to a cheaper space. He thinks he might still have a file on it, so he will ring me back when he gets into the office. Update number two. So I spoke to the agent today and he doesn't have the file anymore, but his recollection is that he negotiated a waiver on the make good obligations, got 60 or 90 days rent free and relocation as a deal for nice bloke. We can't remember if anything happened from the Dobbin. Wow, that must have been so satisfying to tell the douchebag lawyer just that right at the end. Just do what you're paid to do. When I was 18, I worked in a supermarket with a small garden center attached to the back of it. I started out on the checkouts, which was extremely boring, but I like money, so I did it. After about three months of working there, I came into work one day and they were very short staffed in the garden center area. They asked for a volunteer, and wanting to avoid another day of monotonous beeps, I said I'd go. Turns out the garden center is an absolute blast. Basically, if they think you can't use a till, they'll send you to the garden center. The people who worked there were the friendliest, chillest people I'd ever met. The manager, John, had previously owned a gardening business that had failed, and he knew everything there was to know about plants. He was a great manager, always looking out for his staff. He even turned a blind eye to us collecting the pound coins that had been left in the trolleys and spending them on booze after our shift ended. Garden Center also looked after trolley returns. I requested to be transferred to the garden center and John spent the next three months basically showing me how to do his job. After that three months, John left and I applied for the job with his recommendation. At the last minute, they decided that the garden center would be folded into checkouts, i.e. the checkout manager, who was on the other side of the store, would also be our manager. 
I was obviously annoyed, but whatever. I was only there for another few months anyway. The arrangement worked fine in the week when Alice was managing the checkouts. She basically just let us get on with it. I kept doing everything John had done, cashing up, inventory, etc. Then the weekend came along. Enter Karen. Karen perpetually looked like the ink wasn't dry on her second divorce. She hated everyone it seemed, especially me. Every hour I had to go across the store, because she was too lazy to come to me, to give her a status update. I took great pleasure in being overly cheery and coming up with dumb stuff to say when I gave those reports. We sold five spruces. Guess we'll be able to keep the lights on, eh, Karen? Who do I speak to about my bonus? After a few weeks of this, Karen was at fever pitch. So when she waddled over to the garden center, very unusual for her, I was looking forward to seeing what was coming. There's been a customer complaint about the gent's toilet. You need to go clean it. Technically, our contract says that we have to clean any area of the store, but this is usually just the occasional cleaning of counters or sweeping as we have a dedicated cleaning team. I'd never heard of anyone but a cleaner cleaning the toilet. Okay, I'll ask the cleaner to get right on it. I've got some admin stuff to do. I said, knowing what was coming next. No, it's in your contract. You're not paid for doing admin. Just do what you're paid for. As I wandered over to the gents, I wondered how long she'd been planning this. And a plan started forming in my head. I spotted one of the cleaners and asked him to go look at the gents, which of course he did. Now for the first part of my plan. See, usually at the end of the day, I would complete the cash up paperwork. The garden center had a till for customers to pay for garden center stuff and leave it in a folder for the general manager to collect on Monday as he didn't work on weekends. But I wasn't paid to do admin, so I just didn't. Of course, Karen didn't check if it was done, so I just closed up and left for the day. Sunday comes around and I do the same. On Sunday, we also took a select inventory, but that sounds like a lot of admin to me, so I didn't do it. Of course, she couldn't be bothered to check it. About 10am on Monday, I'm called up to the general manager's office. Karen is there looking furious, as well as the general manager, who we'll call Del Boy, because he reminded me of him. Hey, why wasn't cash or inventory done this weekend? Well, Karen told me I wasn't paid to do admin. It's her responsibility to do those things since John left. I've been doing it as a favor, but she told me not to do it, so I didn't. Is this true? At this point, Karen is looking white. Not filling out cash paperwork can lead to dismissal. No, I... That's not what I meant. I just said that you shouldn't do admin. Thanks, OP. You can go now. A few weeks later, Alice told me that Karen had only been on secondment as weekend manager, and after this incident, she was taken off secondment and sent back to the checkout. She was replaced by Bill, who was grumpy as all heck, but let us get on with stuff without getting in our way. I left shortly after, but I went back to visit my parents recently and popped in. She was still on the checkout grumbling to a customer about someone. I went to a different checkout. I like the fact that even after all of that, they didn't even have to clean the toilet. CO tries to get me in trouble, but I win in the end, with a twist. This story is from a long time ago. I was about 17 at the time. Backstory. I didn't have a good relationship with my father. He was a control freak and a bully. This will become relevant much later on. 
I was a Royal Marine cadet, this was in the UK, and had reached the rank of corporal. This meant that I had a section of six or seven cadets under my command. We went on occasional training visits to barracks and started for a few days. A particular visit was to the barracks in Deal in Kent. We had an overnight exercise which involved bivouacking in the woods. We were all settled and had time to spare before the exercise started, so we were chilling out. We had of course been told, as always, to keep our rifles with us at all times, or else. After being called away urgently, this may have been planned, I found my rifle was missing. My fault, but as I say, I think it was a setup. This was confirmed when, not two minutes later, the CO, an adult, arrived for a small inspection. Of course, my rifle was missing, and from the self-satisfied way he spoke, I was certain he was responsible. He told me that I had better find it before the exercise started, or I'd be in big trouble. I gathered my section together and formed a simple plan. They all went off, fanned out and appeared to be practicing for the exercise. Then they got into an argument, about 50 yards from the CO's tent. Of course, being him, he had to stick his nose in. Meanwhile, I had crawled out of the woods to the back of his tent. It was getting dark and I knew my field craft. I unlaced the back of his tent, retrieved my rifle, and laced it all up again, returning to my bivouac in the woods. A little later, the CO turned up, and with a smug grin asked if I had my rifle now. Yes sir, I replied, producing it. Of course, he thought I'd borrowed someone else, so he checked them all. None missing. He returned to his tent, puzzled to find no rifle. Not a thing he could do. I had obeyed orders and got my rifle. Here's the killer. The CO was my father. I was wondering when the backstory was going to become relevant, and yeah, it definitely did. Wow guys, look on screen right now, you see those two videos right there? They're pretty good. I think you should click at least one of them and watch another one.